panelists and to our audience. My name is Dave Klein. I'm going to be the host for this uh, innovation of minority-led companies in a COVID-19 world. Um, for the audience, if you have any questions for the panelists, please put them in the chat. First, I would like to introduce you to the other graduate students who helped to make this session. So we have Laurel, Danette, Thomas, Lisa, Jackie, uh, Micah, Yoa, Manjan, Zhao, Sylvia, Galen, and Zheng Tong. Myself and Zaina, uh, your, your moderator. Now I would like to introduce you to your panelists. So you have Michelle um, Afghani, uh, the founder and CEO of Matcha Konma, Kon, Konma, Konmi, and Mean Barrett Bakery, based in Corpus Christi. As you see here, uh, quality Japanese matcha and affordable price expanded businesses to include sales available on Amazon Prime and partnered with like-minded Kaffir's uh, restaurants throughout Texas. Next slide, please. There we go. The Veronica Drulli, founder and CEO of the uh, Content Confident, Confident. LLC based in Washington, D.C., a boutique digital media agency providing custom website design, social media management, and custom graphic design. Created at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis to help the transition companies to the digital space. Then we have Charles King, uh, general manager of the Eagle Wilton Manors, based in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 30 years of experience in hospitality, industry focused on serving the LGBT community, founder of the Black and White Party, Inc., to fundraise for local HIV and AIDS charities and deserving charitable organizational charitable organizations net nationwide, producers of Bears Bikes and Mayhem, an annual conference and fundraiser. Then we have Krista Martins, founder of Wook Out, based in New York, certified group fitness instructor, professional choreographer, choreographer, Wook Out on demand online high energy Caribbean dance fitness class. Created the Fitness Pro Lab to help fitness professionals grow their brand and build their business, wookout.com. Then we have Willie C, General Manager of Good Kids Education based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Provides US-based studied abroad programs for international middle and high school students. Supports students applying to U US universities. Provides parents with peace of mind while their ch child is studying here in the United States. And then I'd like, next slide. Now I'd like to turn it over, uh, introduce you to Zaina Jackson. She will be your moderator for this session and to your panelists. Thank you and uh, we'll have a great session. Zaina. Thank you so much, Dave. I am really excited to be here with you all today as we talk about these companies and how they were affected by COVID-19. Um, Dave described your companies for us and briefly, um, so let's go ahead and get started talking about how COVID has impacted your businesses directly. Um, the first question I have is going to be kind of anchored towards everybody, um, so whoever would like to speak first, that's up to you. Um, the first question I have is, what are y'all's challenges of being a minority business owner and how has it changed um, from before COVID to like during and kind of after in some areas of the country after COVID. Um, Chuck, if you want to speak first, you're welcome to, or whoever would like to tackle that question first. Um, sure, um, I'm, I'm happy to start um, if that's fine with everybody. Um, so prior to COVID, uh, I'll explain my, our business model first. Essentially, um, we cater to the LGBTQ community um, and, and a large portion of that is to the male population. Although we're a very inclusive um, organization and we hire uh, extensively to that respect as well. Um, so we're a very diverse organization. We actually have employees that from, from multiple uh, companies collectively, um, our employees speak 13 different languages. So we're, we're very diverse. Um, we have employees from Mexico, Brazil, Italy, Spain, Canada, and of course the United States. Um, so <clears throat> our company is uh, essentially a, a, an underground sort of a nightclub atmosphere. Um, 
prior to COVID, our annual sales were anywhere from 120 to $140,000 uh, per month. Um, so we were doing really well as a company, uh, very strong. And then we had a small retail division inside of the, inside of the nightclub. So we would sell like t-shirts and leather goods and fetish wear and things like that. Um, when we closed on March 17th, um, and, uh, we were able to reopen on September 3rd fully, but we had to reopen as a restaurant. Um, during that time that we were closed, we lost over $1.3 million in revenue. Um, when we closed, we had $100,000 cushion in the bank, um, which we had to use that towards rent and utilities while we were closed. Um, we did acquire a PPB loan of $161,000, um, so we were able to pay our employees for eight weeks of pay um, and use some of those funds. 25% uh, of those funds were used for utilities and for rent, um, so we exhausted those. Um, and of course, we, we still had to remain closed. Um, when we were allowed to reopen, um, we had to reopen as a restaurant, and that was the only way we were allowed to open. Otherwise, we would have still had to remain closed until the beginning of October. Um, uh, when we reopened, um, we had to put $20,000 back into the company. Um, so our partners had to come up with another um, $40,000 of operating capital. Um, so now we went from being $50,000 away from being completely debt-free prior to COVID with $100,000 in the bank to now being $90,000 in debt and just trying to survive. So that really, really set us back, which I'm sure everyone here can probably agree. We probably all have similar experiences with that. Um, plus, you know, we have some back rent due too. Um, now we're thriving, um, we're surviving and, and starting to thrive a little bit, um, but we've also added five new revenue centers that we never would have identified if it wasn't for COVID. So in those new revenue centers, um, that we've identified and, and, and made happen, uh, one of them being a restaurant. Uh, one of those we added is local online uh, and ordering and delivery of liquor. Um, we also added, uh, we have Eagle Leathers in store, but we also added an online platform. So we have Eagle Leathers online now. Um, we added a, a, a new platform. Um, one of the things that we've, that I've learned to grow over the years of business is um, creating really, really strong partners with, uh, with your vendors because sometimes your vendors can really turn you on to uh, unique perspectives of business that you never would have identified. And one of these uh, unique ways was um, a, a, a platform that we created called yachtlickers.com. So we now do yacht provisioning uh, for local yachts and boat slips. Um, so it's like a one-stop shop. We, they basically order their liquor or their mixers and things like that. So we take that to their yacht slip we provision it to them and then they go on their excursion, whether it's a one or three day excursion on their yachts or their boats or whatever. So we've created a partnership with boat setters, which is kind of like the Uber of um, uh, boat rentals, um, which is a great partnership. And we wouldn't have done that without our, um, our great partnership with uh, one of our vendors, which is Pernod Ricard. That's like the absolute no licks vendor, Jameson. Um, and then finally, um, we've added uh, drizzly delivery. So we're able to now compete with the national competitors for liquor delivery as well. So through COVID, um, we've really expanded our business model um, because our regular business model, you know, we've, we've had to really dramatically change who we are as a company just to survive. But through, we believe that after COVID is done, we'll come out actually stronger because now we've really changed ourselves and, and expanded who we are. Um, the normal atmosphere of the underground nightclub, um, all of those really important things um, <clears throat> you know, like dancing, close contact, social, meeting, hookups, all those types of things that you would normally experience in nightclubs, those are out the window right now because it's, it's, you know, table seating. You're not really allowed to socialize and move around the club like you normally would. You have to have your masks on. Um, so all of those aspects in a normal nightclub atmosphere are out the window. So it's a very sanitized, sterile sort of atmosphere that we have to live by currently until there's a vaccine and the pandemic is wrapping up. So um, changing our brand um, it's temporary, and once we get back to who we originally were, um, we will do that, but we still have these other five new revenue centers to make us stronger down the road, so. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, Veronica, how about you? What were the challenges that you've been facing as a minority business owner, and have they changed um, pre to post COVID? Right. So from one of the sessions earlier, actually, I heard a really interesting fact that women are more likely to inhibit imposter syndrome than men. So I've definitely battled with that just because since the digital media space is expanding so much now, 
there's so many different elements and competition that come with it. Um, so when it comes to what I do, it is really difficult whenever you're trying to really, you know, make yourself look unique or find your niche. So um, I really have to try and find paths or services that make me unique and then find gaps within the market. So this is why like I actually do custom gifts for Instagram and this is actually how I met Krista Martins. Uh, we actually worked together on some custom gifts of hers, but um, it became one of my most popular services because it was something that you know a lot of people didn't offer. So I guess as for after COVID, I think my competition will only increase uh, since I truly believe that every business is really gonna have to function or advertise online and very efficiently. So I think there will definitely be more competition within the digital media experts and agencies, but definitely more clientele. So that's a really good plus uh, for me. Um, but I definitely am interested to see how all of these businesses pivot to online platforms for sure. All right, so Veronica, you've expanded on your services, just like Chuck. Um, so that's probably a pretty good theme here. What about you, Krista? How have your challenges changed or gotten better or worse through COVID as a minority business holder? Hi. Um, so Walkout is a Caribbean dance fitness class, and all of our classes were held in person. So you know, when March 16th hit and that gym man that gym mandate came down. Um, so did 95% of my revenue. Um, I don't own a brick and mortar space. So I was fortunate in that sense where I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, a lease, commercial lease, commercial space. But I did create an on-demand platform about a year ago. So as a result of COVID, I, I didn't thankfully have to scramble to figure out what I was doing next. I already had this virtual platform. So my virtual platform membership has actually increased uh, by about 75% as a result of COVID. So that was uh, very fortunate for me, for sure. Additionally, I have added several other revenue streams as well. I have created a mentorship program for fitness professionals who want to build their businesses. This is something I've been wanting to do for years, but I've never had the time because I was running physically from class to class to class to class. Um, so now I've added this second income stream uh, to my business, as well as being able to take my instructor training program virtually. Uh, and that, you know, I kind of just threw it out there. I didn't actually think that anyone in the middle of a pandemic would want to, you know, become an instructor. And it was one of our most successful trainings to date. So it's, you know, while we had a significant decrease in revenue from in, from in-person classes, I've definitely seen an increase in, in other streams of revenue as well. And I agree with Veronica and Chuck that, you know, this, this time is actually allowing me to work on things within my business that can only make it stronger in the long run. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess in most ways and some ways, COVID has kind of shifted um, y'all's dreams and y'all's aspirations that you have for your companies and it's making it better. Um, Michelle, what about you? Yeah, for us, um, our challenges, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Me? Um, our challenges before COVID were that we really wanted to be online. Um, we wanted to do more online sales. We wanted people to go to our website um, for all of you, I run two different businesses. I have an online um, retail business for Japanese green tea, and then I also have a local bakery. And for uh, for the, the tea business, most of our business is online. That kind of kept going. Um, sales dropped um, significantly at the start, but then they picked back up and then increased. So for that side of the business, it, it really kind of just kept increasing. And my challenges were really just staffing issues. But for the local bakery, we really wanted to be more online. We wanted to encourage those sales online, people being more efficient. You know, Starbucks has that app that's super helpful. You can get your coffee on the run quickly. And we wanted to be there. And we tried so hard with social media and, you know, pushing people and incentives, but nobody wanted to order their croissants and coffee online. They wanted to come in. They wanted to see all the beautiful pastries. They wanted to pick. Nobody kind of really knows what they want until they see and smell it really in a sense. Right. But with COVID, um, we had to scramble to get that online platform being more efficient because we, we found out very quickly that it wasn't working the way we wanted it to work. So we really had to scramble to get absolutely every product, even the, the seasonals and the fun things that they're making in the kitchen, because in a bakery, they're always, 
you know, changing, adapting, using leftover things to make something different. And that, so there was always something that we didn't have online. So that was our challenge for our customers was to make those available online because COVID really pushed everyone to want to order online. So we got our wish, but we got it overnight. We weren't prepared for that. So we really did scramble. But once we got that um, online presence and people were coming and they wanted to order and they were pushed to order because they didn't want to come inside, it really transformed our business for the better now that we're getting kind of back to normal in, in some sense, um, that we're getting over 50% of our sales through online. So not phone calls, not walk-in, it's all online. We're getting those pre-orders and we're getting that time to prepare their orders and their food. And then, you know, they just call when they're curbside. So it's really, it's been, for us, you know, it was it was definitely, we, we you know, lost a significant amount of sales. And like Chuck said, you know, at the, at the start, it was pretty much, we were almost shut down for that first month and it was very challenging. We ate up a lot of our, reserves but then once we got that online going and people felt a little bit confident to just come do the curbside which was kind of about four weeks after the the shutdowns um things picked up and you know significantly and we're getting all those online orders and now people are, are more um knowledgeable with how to order online how you know how all of that works for many businesses so it's kind of the norm after covid to order online and we're very excited about that because that's just where we wanted to be anyway so it kind of gave that little push to our customers that we felt we tried every avenue to do and no one wanted to do it. Yeah. Well, thank goodness for the internet. I cannot imagine going through this pandemic without it. Um, yeah. I am a fan of the Starbucks app. Um, <laughs> um, yes. So has that been an issue with you, Willie? Has that been a change for you as well, implementing more um, internet-based um, conversations for you, Willie? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, so or our business uh, is more uh, touch base with the client. So since since we're doing business with uh, the foreign country, so China is our main market. So we have our customer, our client from China. Uh, so mostly we have to touch base with the um, with customers to Facebook because there's a lot of trust issues. Sending your child overseas and study and being care take care of people who you never know or stranger or other business. It's, it's a lot of, I think there's a lot of, uh, um, um, lots of training or teaching you have to go through, or a lot of conversation have to go with the parents. And through, after the pandemic, um, you know, that is being hard to, to meet the client or customer face to face. Um, going through online um, is something that we try to transform to, and we use lots of uh, website and increasing the lots of um, platform, including uh, WeChat. Uh, setting up some account or platform through uh, these resources and uh, allow our client, allow our customer to be able to get contact with us through internet uh, instead of, instead of meeting face to face. We don't have uh, our salesperson to meet with the uh, with the individual person. Uh, it's been a, a a huge transform for us, and it's been a lot of challenge. And typically for the visa issue, since after the pandemic, uh, uh, the I think they've been stopped issuing visas for um, foreign students uh, for a while, and it did change. It did, did reduce a lot of our um, incoming students, and incoming clients. Uh, but I believe through the pandemic, many of our competitor um, uh, is facing the same challenges, and we believe the, we're using. Um, I would say we we keep in uh, the front, uh, keep in the front of the the, the industry when trying to. Stay um, as consistent as we can, and we can stay. Uh, and it, typically, for our staff members, they have to they have to provide service to the students. So, since like the beginning of March, we realized the pandemic is going to happen. We uh, we make all our staff work from home. So we have to make sure all of our staff member employees uh, didn't get infected by the COVID nineteen and to be healthy and to be able to keep providing service because that's uh, the trust between uh, the business and our clients. Uh, so after that, we do a lot of change with website and using different platform um, to, to cut contact and to make um, able our customer to be able to reach us through um, internet. Um, it, it, I, I, it's not being very reliable for the common customer to change the way of their shopping for study abroad service, but uh, I think that will be people getting accepted a uh, little bit by little bit, and I think that everything will be going better uh, for the next year. 
Good. Um, well, I have plenty of questions for you all, um, but I just want to make sure that y'all are getting as much out of each other as you want. So if any of you have any questions about each other's challenges or how they're kind of running their business now for one another, feel free to jump in. Um, is anyone have something they're just dying to ask another? Veronica, do you have a question for anyone or Krista, Michelle? No, not right now. Okay. <laughs> yes, Chuck? You're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Here we I, go. I, I do have a question for Willie. Um, have, have you found it, um, you know, because of COVID, they, they were having a lot of, our government was having a lot of, um, they were issuing a lot of mandates, you know, you know, where they were trying to send students back to their countries and things like that. And there were a lot of um, back and forth with all of that. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, that, that, sent, that ended up not having to, to happen. But has that caused a lot of um, international students to rethink coming to the United States for schooling because of all those uh, issues? Yep. Uh, so I think the political issue or the news happened, especially the um, uh, the the the, uh, the riot happened in especially we're from Minneapolis. You know, that's when the first riot happened, and that I think that's a major point when stopping most of uh, international students coming to state because the parents feel unsafe. And one of the challenges that Chinese media keeping having those, uh, I think, negative news about uh, how the United States is going. So that's another impact, but we're trying our best. So we have lots of uh, uh, article or uh, news that we create by ourselves and posting on our website and our blog uh, for our customer to, to, to let our parents, our clients and people that we know to understand what truly happened in the United States. It's, it's not like what the news is showing. It's not, we're still going love and peace. We're still having good business. People are living the regular schedule, not living under scare. Uh, and uh, the visa issue is, I think that's very, uh, that's a big thing because since many high school students graduate and they're looking for university to enroll, and however, they didn't get a, get a chance to apply for their visa, so they have to delay their uh, their study abroad plans. Um, that that's that's part of being challenged. But how, however, we did uh, explore lots of project or study uh, opportunity in China. We have our office in Beijing, and we have our sales team in Beijing. They are doing their work. They're hardworking. They go different province and trying to uh, see if there's uh, a way to help the student to get going in China, so they can probably take some online classes uh, with the with the, with the uh, U.S. university or colleges. So they're still getting credit, earning credit, still going on, they're still um, going forward with their education. So they can uh, step a little bit ahead before they really uh, take a flight and study abroad in the United States. Okay. Well, my my add off to you because I I mean. Um... The, the, the students, the international students to the economy in America is, it has a major impact to our economy in the United States. So without the international students that, that would that would have a great effect on our economy. So we appreciate what you do, so. Great, thank you so much for that input, you guys. Um, Veronica, this question is gonna be for you just cause I know that your business kind of was born out of COVID um, and you did mention the imposter effect and how that's, how you're kind of experiencing that. So I just am wondering how you're staying positive through the pandemic and has your outlook of your business changed at all? Right, so I actually started my business during COVID. So I have a little bit of a different story. I was a freelancer for a couple of years and I saw the need of companies having to transition to these online platforms and enhance their digital footprints. So I had been a freelancer for years and worked in various different industries, health and wellness, real estate. I even worked for the fashion industry uh, for the New York Fashion Week event and I make custom websites. I provide social strategy, digital marketing strategy for businesses, graphic design, Wikipedia page creation, literally anything that is digital. I am your girl. Um, but it really didn't have much on a Fact on my business model just because I created my business model from COVID. Um, I had just been hitting the ground running ever since, but 
Um, I will say that, you know, I think I'm speaking for everybody. Um, COVID has definitely impacted a lot of mental health situations. And I think that it is so important to focus on your business, but also focus on your self care. It's so important right now to maintain a good mental health and being an entrepreneur, we find it hard to step away from work. Um, I'm sure I'm speaking for a lot of you when I say that, but I deliberately like color code my calendars. I make sure to take days off. And since my role is mostly focused on social media, I do try to take social media detoxes. And I never in a million years thought that this is going to happen. Um, but I think it's important for us to stay positive, stay on task, and also maintain good mental health and good awareness of others and be considerate about everybody's journey and try and find a way your business can positively impact you know everybody that is yeah. going through the same thing as all of us so it's definitely important to support each other during all of this wow um so michelle how have you been able to balance your work and your life in during covid i know that you've had a time of it raising a family and running your business at the same time yeah i actually run three businesses i have another real estate business and i have three kids uh when the the can you hear me yes um, when the pandemic hit, I was actually seven months pregnant. So oh the goodness. biggest um, challenges for me were staffing because of course, so many people couldn't come to work anymore between kids and that kind of stuff. So um, there was no balance the first three months of COVID. Uh, my kids suffered a little bit, probably a lot more than I know. And um, because I had to keep all of these businesses going, especially for the staff members who really needed those paychecks to pay their bills. Um, a lot of um, uh, bakery staff, they live paycheck to paycheck. Um, and that was really important to them. So while we lost a lot of staff, I filled in all of the gaps, but you know, the changes that, that happened from COVID were changes that we wanted to happen, like I mentioned earlier. So I remained positive. I, I, you know, I, I worked crazy hours. I didn't have a lot of balance at the beginning, but I found, I kind of found my stride, uh, a couple months in with the kids and it was definitely tough, but it all, you know, I just, you know, kept going, um, did the best that I could. Um, we got through the hardest part, I think. So right now we're kind of, um, you know, things are picking back up, sales are picking back up. I got my kids back in school, they're in-person school. So that was definitely a huge nice, right? plus for me. And especially getting, you know, with my own mental health, getting them back in school so that they can be around other people and that they're not sitting at home all the time on their iPads while I'm working 24 seven was a huge change for us. And that was a change for the better. And we're just kind of, you know, do the, we're working around the new normal and staying as positive as we can. And we adjusted very quickly. So that was a huge thing we had to, it was, you know, the first two months were just, you know, put your head down and make those changes that we wanted to make so that we could kind of find that balance afterwards and come out the other side. And um, we made it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's so. awesome. I'm glad to see you're making it through. Um, Amen. Our my professor mentioned that women entrepreneurs have it harder. Do you agree with that, Krista? Or are you? How do you feel about that and being a woman entrepreneur? Uh, I do think that. I think I think we live in a in a man's world, <laughs> and so I definitely agree that uh, women entrepreneurs do have it harder. Access to less funding, as as the professor said. Um, I'd also love to speak to what Veronica said about the, you know, the mental health aspect and taking yeah. care of yourself. And, you know, during the pandemic, I, I feel like we really have to give ourselves some grace. You know, this is something unlike any of us have ever experienced in our lifetime. And I do think it's important to remain positive, but also on the days when you're feeling the feels, it's okay to feel that and recognize, um, that this is a different experience that we're having right now. And, and so I just, I just wanted to share that. And I, and I really feel like we do all as entrepreneurs, as, as, as human beings, we all have to give ourselves grapes during this time. Um, and I also really feel like, you know, I've been able to serve my community because I think fitness and, and exercise is a great way to get away from it all and a great way to relieve stress. So my focus has really been just showing up for my community so that they can still have that outlet for them. Great, thank you so much for that. 
Um, so I do have a few questions for Willie and Chuck um, regarding y'all staffing. I know Michelle kind of touched on how she's had to change her staffing around since the COVID um, pandemic. So I'm just wondering how y'all staffing has changed over time and was it is it different now than it was at the beginning of the pandemic when you first had to close your doors? Did you lose a lot of employees? How has that looked for y'all's businesses? Um, sure. So, um, so before the pandemic, we had uh, 48 employees, um, full-time, part-time, it was about 30 to 35 uh, full-time equivalent. Um, and currently we have about, about 20 employees. Um, most of them are part-time. Um, so our staffing has dramatically changed. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to, um, to say exactly when, uh, we'll return to normal. Um, we're slowly trickling into hiring a couple more people here and there. Um, you know, we're going to be hiring some new drivers pretty soon because our, our, our yacht provision is, is starting to expand and, and our, 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 our driving for the liquor sales is, is starting to go up. And, um, you know, so uh, things are starting to improve. But at the same time of it, um, cases in the United States are going up. So, you know, we don't know what, what's looming. Um, is there going to be another shutdown and lockdown? Yeah, we have no idea. So, um, so there could be anything could happen. Um, but um, the, currently, um, you know, the people that are working with us, um, you know, we they rely on us. It's their livelihood, and uh, you know, hopefully, um, we'll make it through to the end to to keep them all working. Um, hopefully, we won't have another shutdown. So yeah, hopefully not. Um, Willie, how about you? How has your staffing changed, and is it how does it look different than today? Yeah, that's really. Um, I think they're really a tough um, topic. So. We were, it's a very special situation for us. We were planning to have a expanding business this year. And unfortunately the pandemic happened. We used to have to have student recruiting from Europe and uh, a new English, uh, music program uh, with group of students working with 20 school, high school in China. We'll have like classes and classes of students coming um, this year. However, uh, it's being delayed or how some being terminated of the project. Um, but we did a lot of preparation work before uh, 2020. So that was like ahead of time of the pandemic. We have to choose to have some cut off for some uh, planning a person or, or staff member uh, because of the shutdown of the pandemic. However, we, I, I, we, we, our structure, we keep all those um, um, our core um, employees that will be able to uh, to, to to be able to survive during this time and be able to expand afterwards to reopen the business when 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 the pandemic is over, uh, so we have we still have this um, uh, our core team of our, our business and to to developing social networking, social media pla internet platform, uh, and providing our consistent service for our clients. And at the same time that uh, we planning out a new structure, new planning, business plan for uh, after after pandemic. And because our, our business team in China was still working, uh, they, they're, they're open up right now. They're able to meet face to face with uh, client and customer. They'll be able to touch base with schools. Uh, so uh, we still having lots of recruitment going on uh, that will be ending 2021. Wow. Um well, we've got about 10 minutes left. And before we jump into questions from our audience, um, is there any questions or experiences that y'all have for each other that you wanna share or kind of bounce ideas off of at all? No? I have a question. Maybe I'll ask it yes. to everybody here. So as, as this conference is about creating knowledge, uh, Michelle and uh, everything, Veronica and Krista here, what, are, what, are, what is the roadmap for the future? What is, if you walk away saying, remember this, because I've admitted it, Chuck, you, you <laughs> start with $100,000 and then you're looking at this, this, this negative red coming and you probably didn't sleep some nights here, right? But now you're, you're <laughs> and you're smiling here. So, right, and, and Veronica is like, why are people not coming? <laughs> Right, and Chris is saying, you know, that thing I was playing with later on, it saved me, right? Which is what I'm hearing here. So, what what is the roadmap? What is what 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 one or two comments that you all want to share, and then Zina, maybe you lead the way here. Something for everybody to walk away with. What might that be? Let's start, Zina. I'm going to start with Chuck because he's on my top right corner, and then we'll go okay. down. <laughs> 
Um, I guess if I had to say something quickly, I would say um, create the best, strongest relationships you can with, with because sometimes uh, positive business and, 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 and successful business things can happen from the most unexpected uh, places. And, um, and, you, I, and wherever your passion and your drive comes from, when things get really hard, that's where you have to go to and remember why you're in it in the first place. And that will keep your drive going. I think those are the two most important things I can probably tell you. Yes, thank you for that, Chuck. I love that. Um, Michelle, how about you? What does your roadmap kind of look like for the future? Um, well, for us, I always felt like we were able to adapt very quickly, but for us, we're even focusing even more on diversity and being able to adapt um, to anything that comes at us because we really don't know what the future looks like. So it could be like you were men uh, mentioned earlier was, you know, more shutdowns. We don't know. Are we getting there because we're getting into the flu season and the flu season going to cause that? Um, also more staffing issues because people are going to be getting the flu and um, whatever sickness people have now, it means they're out no matter what, for a period right. of time. So um, we're just, you know, we're on our toes. We're ready for whatever comes our way. We're still, um, you know, kind of building and working on what, you know, the online presence and, um, you know, uh, getting creative with promotions as much as possible. And um, whatever we can, you know, however we can adapt as much as possible with this kind of new, um, pre mostly online presence. So we're just, I think the biggest thing is being able to adapt. We always were a business that could adapt quickly and we listened to our customers and we made those changes. We were never like, this is our business plan and this is our model and this is exactly where we're gonna go. We always had um, you know, situations where we had to make changes very quickly. So I feel like that's our strong point and we're just ready kind of for whatever is gonna be thrown at us and just keep adapting as much as possible to what our customers needs are, listening to our customers. And of course, um, um, keeping those strong relationships with our vendors because everyone mm -hmm. is uh, struggles at that time when when um when something like this happens again so we're just going to keep it in mind for the future that you know anything is possible after covid anything is possible so we want to be as diverse as possible build on that having other product possibly to sell online and things like along that nature and then being uh, ready to adapt and whatever comes our way this this winter season and next yeah, everything year. is definitely possible we've seen today through um all of y'all's kind of testimonies through this um, truly anything is possible. So Veronica, what do you kind of look forward to in your business going forward? Yeah, so as of right now, I am a one-man band since I've been a freelancer, just started this business in May whenever COVID kind of, you know, ramped up. Um, but I guess my future is just to expand, hire on a team, and really get the ball rolling and just serve more people in my community and all around the globe and really get these digital platforms out there and help these companies strive. Um, and, you know, if you are looking to start your own business, whoever's out there, um, just start. That is like my biggest advice because, you know, there's going to be bumps in the road and unexpected occurrences, but it's all about the journey. And, you know, it's really like the most um, valuable thing that I've probably ever done in my life. And I've learned so much. So if you want to contact me, I'm going to put some things in the chat. Um, but yeah, that's the last thing that I have to say. Great, thank you so much, Veronica. Um, Krista, what would your advice be for giving any of our students listening today who want to start a small business? What is your advice for them? Veronica just gave hers, what's yours? I think it's definitely to be open to change that when you have that map laid out in front of you, the likelihood of it going exactly according to that plan is very unlikely. So be willing to change, be willing to grow and be willing to make decisions. I think a lot of the time as, uh, you know, as new entrepreneurs, you're, you're hesitant to kind of make that, make that decision. Trust your gut, go with it. It's your business. You get to decide how this is going to turn out. And, and ultimately, if you're not okay with it at the end of the day, um, it's going to re be reflected in your business. So I think that's the best piece of advice I can say. And share your story with your clientele. Uh, that's something that I've definitely learned uh, during COVID especially. I'm, you know, I, I tend to be more introverted by nature and, and I've really recognized that sharing my story with my community has also really helped me connect with them more them connect with me more, trust in the brand more. And overall, it's been extremely beneficial. So trust in yourself, trust your gut, be adaptable to change. And as one of my mentors always says, take messy action, just go for it. 
Yay, thank you so much for that advice, Krista. Um, that seems to be all the time we have left today. Does anyone else have anything they want to add in um, in their story sharing or anything like that? I think this was just incredible presentation here. I think everybody's responding so it's so great here. You guys are the future here. Thank I you. call it the end of the status quo here. And most of you are going to lead this post COVID-19 here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's, you know, we hear so many like, Chuck, you really resonated. You start the session saying, well, you know, we had some money and now we're in the hole, <laughs> the gloom and stuff. And you, you have the most infectious smile here, Veronica, Michelle, Krista as well, right? But I have to say this, and I sit in the chat section here, research shows women entrepreneurs have a harder time. That's just reality. Okay, it's the net. It's it's a men's club out there. We the, the the money's flowing more to this. Things are changing, but you have to lead this change. It's not just going to happen overnight. So your success stories will help lead younger gen other generation of women to come in, right? So so and build your networks. You know, so Krista, Veronica, Michelle, you know, you should all be connected already because you never know how you all will meet in the future and in what areas in what realms here. This is, this is how men did it. So this is how I think you all need to manage it as well here. So I just wanna say, this is just remarkable. And we are planning to kidnap you all for GW. So just to let you all know that we have plans for all of you here. And with ICSB, I got a message saying here, you all are gonna be invited to come to ICSB. We have so many great events. I think Hillary mentioned them. We have a big, big event happening in Paris next year, July 12 to 16. So in case COVID is under control and Paris is open here. Who does not want to go to Paris, right, for, for a conference here? So, right, and, and I think so. So we'll, uh, we'll all invite you to come. We're going to have a good, we actually have a full-fledged program with ICSB on women entrepreneurs in Paris. We're talking to President Macron's office. We're talking to many people here. We're, we're going to have a remarkable event um, next, uh, next July here. In this conference, I want to thank Zina and Glenn and David and every, and everybody uh, that came here. This is just remarkable. This is just the, one of the most powerful sessions I saw here. And I wanna thank you all. Zina, fantastic job as a moderator. Thank you. I, so I, have, plan, I, I have plans for you. David, I'd like to, you. I would like to thank uh, Zaina for moderating this and all of our lovely panelists today for coming out and joining, joining our session today. Uh, very, very informational. Um, very inspiring stories. Thank you all for joining us today. I also want to remind uh, just not just the panelists, but also the attendees that tomorrow we are having the Women's Entrepreneur Global Conference. It's been put in the chat for ISB. It's the first Women's Entrepreneur Global Conference held by GW. So please, uh, if you have time tomorrow, please attend that. And again, thank you all for your time today and, and enjoy the rest of your, your day today. Thank you again so much. Thank, Thank you. you we're going to we're going to take about a half hour break. We're going to start exactly at 1255 for the afternoon session. So I look forward to seeing you here. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Talking to you all. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye.